So um, thank you guys for coming. I think so. Um, this will I, I have a bunch a fair number of slides that, to kind of lead in and because I think this is kind of a complicated topic and preoperative therapy for rectal cancer is, is pretty complicated. It can be very confusing uh, in terms of choice of therapy and how we got here. So I chose a number of trials to try to just kind of with one slide for each kind of hopefully, you know, if you can tell it like it's a story, I think it's easier to remember and kind of understand how we got here. So um, <clears throat> we'll just kind of jump right in. Really, we'll go over really the, the background and kind of like I was saying, the evolution of uh, various preoperative therapies and kind of how we got to however many options we have today. It's kind of kind of a lot uh, and they're cross applied in what can seem a haphazard manner. And then basically pose the question of whether or not everybody needs the same preoperative therapy. Uh, and then I know I sent out two articles. One was really a protocol. Hopefully that was more thought provoking about what uh, people are looking at and what would qualify as a reasonable uh, uh, trial for uh, quote unquote low risk locally advanced rectal cancer. Um, and then we'll discuss the, the Oakham observational study. Um, so just real briefly, this is something that um, I think is confusing and I didn't know for a while, but the, the important differences between what it means to be short course and long course radiation. So short course radiation to be very clear, short course radiation is gonna be 25 gray delivered in just five fractions. So you know that can really be accomplished in a week for a patient. Um, and then you generally undergo surgery within one to two weeks of completion of that therapy. So that time course is very different than what we call long course radiation, where you typically get 50.4 divided into 28 fractions. So delivered over about five and a half weeks, again, with the patients coming Monday through Friday to the Radonc treatment center um, to get their therapy. Um, the um, the chemotherapy, if, if, so long course radiation can be given alone. It can be given in the form of chemo radiation, but it's important to understand that the chemotherapy that's given with long course to make it quote unquote chemo radiation is not, you know, the full multimodal intense induction therapy designed to induce a total treatment response. It's a radiosensitizing dose of 5-FU plus minus leucovorin to add to efficacy of your radiation therapy. So it, yes, it is chemotherapy and that is a quote unquote systemic treatment, but it is really meant to add efficacy to your radiation therapy. So even though it's chemo, I would still in your mind think of long course chemo radiotherapy as um, really just a local treatment um, is, is how I would think of it. There will be other instances. I'll, I'll talk about short course with delay, short course with induction. Those are different instances where you would give a short course like it's listed at the top. And then instead of operating in two weeks, you might operate in eight weeks, you might operate in three months. And during that time, you give conventional chemotherapy, something like full FOX, that's meant to be induction or full intensity multimodal therapy. So it's important to kind of understand that uh, because the trials compare very different things. And so we kind of, we end up making a lot of cross trial comparisons. But so we'll just kind of jump right into the evolution of preoperative therapy. The first study that really kind of put neoadjuvant therapy of any kind on the map is the Dutch trial in 2001. This was a comparison of short course radiation versus nothing. And it was really pre-pelvic MRI. It included all T stages. Tumors that were staged clinically as T3 or T4 were frequently done on exam if they were felt to be fixed. I mean, I think we can all imagine how imprecise that may or may not be. Um, but regardless, there was a, the take-home message is that there was a superior two-year local control rate in those that received some neoadjuvant therapy, largely driven by those that were in the clinical T3, T4 group no difference in overall survival, but this puts neoadjuvant therapy on the map for improved local control. Short course radiation therapy. What puts long course chemo radiation on the map is the follow on German trial in 2004. It's you know kind of a similar type of comparison, this time only including T3, T4 and positive patients. Um, and then uh, again, reduced now five-year local recurrence rate. This is the first trial that really showed improved sphincter preservation uh, in the group that received long course chemo, radio, chemo radiation versus no, um, versus really adjuvant therapy, I should say, at 39 versus 19%. Again, we're not looking at differences in overall survival, disease free survival. This is local control and sphincter preservation. But 
those things are obviously very important to patients and, and they're worth considering. So the follow-on POLIS trial now is a comparison of upfront short course XRT versus long course chemo radiation. So the first kind of head to head comparison of two therapies as opposed to neoadjuvant therapy versus a lack of neoadjuvant therapy. Again, this involved T3 and T4, any N. Again, consider T3 or T4 if they're tethered on exam. So this is an, a much older time period of enrollment. Um, we're going to get into the really mandatory nature of pelvic MRI in this day and age, but still, um, there was a little bit higher path CR rate uh, and lower um, circumferential resection margin positivity in the long course group, but really no differences in local recurrence, overall survival, disease free survival, or even toxicity. Uh, and this trial was old enough, I don't want to malign the, you know, surgeons were doing their best at this time, but I think the importance of TME was probably not emphasized at the time that this trial was enrolling compared to uh, the way in which we emphasize it today. Um, so now we've established, you know, something up front is better than nothing up front, largely, you know, maybe equivalence between short and long course. And then in 2012, we have the, the trans-Tasman trial. This is a, a trial of short course radiation again versus long course chemo radiation only for T3 patients with varying levels of nodal involvement. And in this in this trial, both groups went on to receive adjuvant chemotherapy, formal chemotherapy, not just that radiosensitizing dose that I was talking about. And so again, you see no differences in local recurrence, recurrence free survival in a distant metastatic fashion or overall survival. There, this is the first time that we see that potentially very distal tumors in the final five centimeters or final third of the, of the rectum may be at higher risk for local failure for potentially less aggressive neoadjuvant regimens. You can see in red, those very distal tumors were those that potentially benefited uh, with a reduction in uh, local occurrence in the long course group. It was not significant because of uh, an issue with power and the low N in that subgroup. But I think pretty clearly, you know, if, if, any of us were in clinic and we were offered a 12 versus a 3% local recurrence, we, we would understandably take the therapy that would offer us a 3% local recurrence rate. There was not a difference in APR rates uh, in this trial, but um, obviously in other trials, we've already talked about the benefits of sphincter preservation when comparing neoadjuvant versus no therapy. So we'll just go through a few more. I promise I, I try not to have too many, but there's a lot. So. Um, the, the purpose of this trial is, is really not a big take home about this being earth shattering, but this is probably the first time in a large, well done prospective trial that what's called short course with delay is introduced. This is the Stockholm two trial, Stockholm three rather, but so this is a three arm non inferiority trial comparing short course conventional radiation therapy, long course chemo radiation, what's called short course with delay, where you would do the conventional five by five radiation up front. And then you would wait and do surgery typically somewhere between four to eight weeks after. In this trial, there's really no differences between the groups. And so it established it as a viable therapy, but it opens the door for what I talked about earlier, the short course with induction. Now, you know, potentially can we use this delay period to additionally give therapy that may benefit these patients rather than, you know, just kind of wait, frankly. But um, there was some... Um, Within the two groups that received some form of short course therapy, there was a reduction in post-op complications in the short course with delay versus the conventional short course radiation therapy. But really this trial puts what's called short course with delay on the map and allows for us to now start to think of different, more creative ways to use chemotherapy as opposed to just a radiosensitizing manner. So the Polish two trial now builds on that and uses short course with consolidation chemo. So these patients were getting true induction chemotherapy, um, not a full total neoadjuvant approach. They still got adjuvant therapy, but they got short course. During that delay period, they got chemo, and this was compared to conventional long course chemo radiation. There was no major differences in terms of the R0 resection, um, disease-free survival, and, and distant metastases. There was some improvement in what we call the PATH-CR, pathologic complete response rate. Uh, again, that was not significant in the short course with consolidation group, but this is, I think, what has initially driven interest and people have built on in terms of if you're faced with a tumor that you feel like you really need to downstage, maybe, hey, short course with induction instead of just conventional short course with delay 
is an option where I can really aggressively try to downstage this tumor and either spare someone's sphincters or just downstage it so that I can get a, a negative uh, CRM at the time of my TME resection. So this now, you know, our short course radiation therapies, our use of chemotherapy, things you can, you can tell at each step, it's getting a little bit more and more aggressive in terms of what we can potentially do to try to downstage these patients. But now we're talking about trials that involve patients who get preoperative pelvic MRI. Some of those earlier trials did not. And so what's the importance of the pelvic MRI? And I think that's really what the Mercury 1 and 2 trials um, really solidified. The, the junior residents really already discussed this on Monday, so I won't belabor the point, but the Mercury 1 trial was really what put pelvic MRI very firmly on the map in terms of it being better. Also, it is, it is the, the only modality that will best reliably assess the likelihood of circumferential resection margin involvement in terms of your mesorectal fascia, right? A, a transrectal ultrasound is not going to give you that. CT scans are not going to give you that. And okay, so why do we care about CRM? It's it's right there in the second bullet, right? It is more predictive than any aspect of the TNRM stage for local recurrence, disease-free survival, or overall survival. So, you know, it may not be something in your staging. It may not be something that um, you come across when you're reading a note as you see a patient in clinic, but it should be very much at the forefront of your mind when you're discussing these patients in your tumor board in terms of, you know, what's the CRM, what's the CRM, what's the CRM? Like, yes, we need to know the T and the N stage for determination of preoperative therapy, but really I would say the CRM is probably just as, if not more important, and that's established by the Mercury 1 trial. So Mercury 2 built on that, and this was really a prospective enrollment of patients with low, so less than six centimeter from the anal verge, um, rectal cancers after pelvic MRI, and based on several factors, um, be that the involvement of um, uh, extramucosal uh, venous involvement, which quadrant of the rectum was involved, how close the CRM was. They determined patients that were deemed quote unquote safe versus unsafe. And those that would conventionally get a, a neoadjuvant therapy, but were determined to have a safe um, CRM were actually enrolled for upfront surgery. And there was a, a positive CRM rate of only 1.6% in that group. So you know, it's not necessarily what we do all the time, but I think this very much shows that it can be safe to take a low-risk T3 rectal cancer to the operating room and anticipate coming away with a negative pathologic CRM, right? It's not necessarily something that we talk about a lot. You know, I think by rote memorization, most people think, oh, T3, they need some upfront therapy. But I think this more firmly establishes the nuance that pelvic MRI adds to the picture and the importance of getting a high-quality pelvic MRI as part of your preoperative staging. In addition, there was about a 29% rate of downstaging patients who were pre-treatment pre positive for their CRM down to, to negative uh, after some form of upfront therapy. Okay, so the, I apologize, it's a bit of a kind of whirlwind of stuff, but the last trial that I'll talk about that's actually comes out after the, the trial that we wanna to discuss today is what's called the RAPIDO trial. And this is probably, um, the newest uh, likely practice changing article in rectal cancer that I came across really, but it's, it's now a comparison of short course with consolidation so that probably most aggressive approach that we've discussed so far, other than total neoadjuvant versus long course chemo radiation. And this only included high risk patients. So those with T4 disease, N2 disease, lymph nodes outside of your planned margin of resection or by pelvic MRI, a involved circumferential resection margin all patients at enrollment had a high quality pelvic MRI and they showed that, you know, what would be a little bit more aggressive upfront treatment, the short course with consolidation chemo improved for the first time, you know, a real difference here in three year disease related treatment failure that could be in the form of local recurrence or distant metastases. Um, and it was, um, it was significant really across virtually all subgroups. So probably the, the latest thing that will will change therapy for these people with truly locally advanced uh, high-risk rectal cancers. So that is a lot to synthesize. And so just to try to summarize it into some useful takeaways. So the literature so far, kind of the story of the literature has shown us that preoperative radiation therapy improves local control, just broadly speaking, as kind of an umbrella statement. And it can improve your sphincter preservation taken collectively, you know, those first three trials I showed, the, the Dutch, German, and Polish one trials. Um, short course XRT is, you know, there's not 
a ton of perfect new trials that show this, but it's largely equivalent to long course chemo radiotherapy for many quote unquote locally advanced. Um, that would be the people that we would conventionally consider for neoadjuvant therapy, rectal cancers in terms of their local recurrence, disease free and overall survival. Some of these trials having been limited by the lack of a high quality pelvic MRI at enrollment. And then the use of post-operative chemotherapy has really kind of morphed in the literature from the radiosensitizing dose used in long course chemo radiation to now, you know, more and more trials of short course with consolidation. So true induction chemotherapy or even total neoadjuvant therapy, especially building on what's called the IDEA trial. I'm not going to discuss it here, but it's something that comes up a lot in two tumor border, and I encourage people to read it, but there are certain tumor characteristics where you can uh, get away with just three months of total therapy, and that can all be accomplished in a new management setting, but so chemotherapy is getting more and more typically aggressive in the upfront setting, and who are the patients that this is beneficial for? It appears, based on the trials that I've presented, to be most beneficial for those at especially high risk of local failure that you might benefit from some earlier downstaging preoperatively, and those being the very distal tumors, shown in that trans-Tasman trial. Those being, you know, improving path CR is, is actually kind of a murky endpoint, but it could be used as a surrogate for, I would say, better local preoperative downstaging. Um, and so kind of drawing upon the Polish 2 trial, that might be a reason to, to use more aggressive upfront chemotherapy. And then for very advanced tumors based on the Rapido trial results that I just showed. So we have a number of treatment options at our disposal. We have radiation, chemotherapy, surgery. Really, the next question is, do all locally advanced cancers need all three? And you know, posed differently, is there kind of a favorable subset of locally advanced rectal cancer that just maybe needs two out of three or just needs one of the three modalities? And what are those modalities? Is it going to be radiation and surgery? Is it going to be chemo and surgery? Or as much as we may not like to admit, is it going to be just chemo and radiation? Um, there's a trial on that that we presented earlier in the year. I think that was done at uh, MSK. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 you know, under, understandably, right? Um, so, and it's not just that we want to. Um, I mean, obviously, patients will be highly motivated to to preserve their rectum and especially preserve their sphincters. But it's important for us. You know, a lot of patients come into clinic and they say, "I'll do whatever you." recommend doc. And so it's important for us to, to think about, you know, not just the monetary cost, but the time loss in terms of the best treatment for them. Are we saying that they need to come to the rad on appointments for five and a half weeks every single day, and they're coming from far off and they have a caregiver and all these sorts of things? Or is there a manner in which we can accomplish similar or potentially better therapy in five days and then get them onto chemotherapy first? Do they just need short course and then immediate surgery? Um, there are differences in compliance with these regimens that I didn't get into, uh, just to not kind of go too deep into some of these trials. And then also there are important differences potentially in post-treatment uh, sexual and bowel dysfunction um, that are very important really for, for men and women, um, depending on your choice of preoperative therapy. And so as we get into kind of parsing out these groups, that's really the reason that I sent out these two articles you know, I think what is not debatable is that a high resolution pelvic MRI preoperatively is critical. And it's really kind of the only acceptable preoperative local staging imaging modality. There are, there are unique times where one wants to add a transrectal ultrasound for some nuance or maybe an assessment of a node, but really in terms of assessment of the CRM, the pelvic MRI is the only thing that's good enough. So the, the protocol for the Quicksilver study was sent out. I, I appreciate folks reading it. I, I'm probably going to mostly focus on the Oakham paper because it's kind of a conventional study results that we can discuss those sorts of things. But this pretty nicely lays out the exact thought process and kind of the delineation of what would and would not constitute a high risk or a lower risk locally advanced rectal cancer and their sort of treatment algorithm. Um, and so I show this slide really just to, to summarize the the document, but I plan to basically move on to the to the Oakham trial, and then we'll kind of we'll start to kind of open this up for discussion. So, um, I think one of the last sentences of the intro uh, summarizes kind of well the impetus for this trial um, and the the author's thought process. You know, the challenge at this decision point is preoperative identification of patients with a low risk of local recurrence who can be cured by high rates 
excuse me, who can be cured at high rates by TME surgery alone and patients at high risk of local recurrence who need neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy before resection. So now we'll kind of start to open it up and ask some questions. And um, I mean, honestly, we can discuss any angle of the trial that people wish to discuss, but we'll start by just kind of going through their methods, their results, and then start to post some discussion points. So um, does anybody mind potentially kind of talking to me about just, just some of the inclusion criteria? What were what were the patients that we were really looking at in this trial? Or it's a study, it's, a, it's not a trial, I should say, it's observational. The, the inclusion criteria, they included people who had uh, yeah. solitary cancer of the rectum. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, and they defined that as less than anything less than the patient's risk for the people in the facility. Mm -hmm. um, they had to have staging and clinical PCU to see score. Mm -hmm. And they included any nodal or cystic mm -hmm. or yeah, any, any TM or any nodal positivity, but uh, they had to have no cystic uh, They were <coughs> Surgery with field of intent for the aim of RDO or RM resection. Um, so those are the study criteria. Okay. And then if I if I recall, I think they um they also included there was a, a stipulation they could, it is not mandatory, but they could also have a positive or negative CRM. So they included patients, you know, a CRM is considered positive if based on your pelvic MRI, the distance between the tumor and your mesorectal fascia is less than a millimeter, right? It doesn't necessarily have to have contact on imaging, but less than a millimeter as measured by imaging. So these are, you know, I think pretty conventionally high, high risk locally advanced tumors. You know, they have either an involved CRM, either a high T stage, or the, the lower third is, is another, you know, potential aspect that can make them high risk for local recurrence based on the previous data. Um, I actually forgot what I was going to say, so we're going to move on. Um, so the primary outcome, Kat, just stick with it. Uh, the primary outcome that they looked at were, did they have five-year local recurrence for uh, part of the study? Yeah, it, I think it was a little confusing. I think the way that they phrased it, they their goal was to report five-year uh, local recurrence, but they included any patient that had at least three years of follow-up. And so many of the results are phrased as Kaplan-Meier estimates of three-year local recurrence. I think they ultimately plan to present the five-year data, but here I listed three-year local recurrence, but they do state that their planned primary outcome is five-year local recurrence. Todd, any any secondary endpoints that they looked at? Yeah, the involvement of the uh, CRM and then the quality of the mesorectal tissue and the quality of the droplet. Okay, yeah, which unfortunately is not something that they delve in a ton to in the article in terms of the adverse effects of um, chemoradiotherapy, but that's okay. But yes, that, that's all accurate. So the positivity of their CRM at the time of resection. Um, and then, yes, basically some markers of surgical quality in terms of intraoperative tumor violation, and then various other forms of treatment failure, you know, whether that's overall survival, disease-free survival, or distant metastases. So that's kind of, that's what we're, what we're headed towards. And then the, the patients that were included all underwent a preoperative pelvic MRI. In the, the two groups, what, what are the, what's the, it's an observational trial, so it's not really an experimental group, but Fahey, what's, what are the two groups? What what treatments did they receive? Right, and what kind of chemo radiation? If, you know, short course with delay, long course. What? How do they describe it? How do they spell it out? <clears throat> yeah, and then but well, and what was the chemo given with that? Five yeah, just five of you. So that's kind of that conventional long course chemo radiation. So that's not. So if I if I go back, if I were if if I were to flash if I were to flash this up on the screen. Uh, yeah. So this is actually, this is a really nice uh, kind of history about the patient, but kind of the last little bit. We had a mitral in 15 minutes, and what we do with mitral is so instrumental in changing the way we approach things because of what 
Absolutely. And then so exactly. So it's important to note, like, what are you comparing at the outset in terms of, you know, say there is a failure of local control or, or an improvement in local control. Uh, so we're comparing upfront TME versus long course chemo radiation. Right. And then the, the typical time to their subsequent surgery was was six to eight weeks after that new adjuvant therapy. Um, Beth, can you talk to me just about some of kind of the the initial results? You know, there's this this protocol that they put forth, not every treat, not every patient was treated per protocol. Um, and then just kind of the, the initial three-year local recurrence rates and stuff. Yeah. So, um, they had a total of 27% approximately were actually um, down phase. So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll discuss that as well. Um, and so this is, rather than leave it for the discussion later, I mean, I think it's important to, to even bring this up now. Um, so it's an important difference in observational data versus randomized data. Um, Todd, can you maybe explain? So, you know, this is confusing to me. How could this group that gets new adjuvant therapy have such a higher APR rate than the TME group, right? Aren't they getting a more aggressive therapy? I don't, it seems counterintuitive to the sphincter preservation that I just presented in terms of the benefits of neoadjuvant therapy. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's, it's because this is an observational trial, right? There is selection at the outset saying that the patients with you know one of those factors either a, a anticipated positive crm or certain other factors would be in that neoadjuvant group right if this was a randomized trial and they were balanced groups and then you had a higher apr rate or a higher local failure rate that would be concerning if it's an observational trial and from the outset you say a higher risk subset is going to get neoadjuvant and a lower risk subset is going to get direct surgery then it's explainable and it, it makes sense. But so it's something to keep in mind because at various times during this study, it will appear that the neoadjuvant group does worse and it is not necessarily a shortcoming of neoadjuvant long course chemo radiation. It's that we have selected them into this group because this is an observational trial, not a randomized trial. So um, just something very important to keep in mind. Um, a few other results. Um, the, the CRM is something that's also talked about a lot. Kat, can you discuss some of the CRM results? Um, so <coughs>
talk about just complete the brick and mortar. For those who underwent primary operation, um, their CRM product can be level and really like that uh, is not quite done for them. I think that uh, and then their results are I think I think you might have that flipped. <laughs> But the, the negative CRM rate of the direct TME group was what? I have I have ninety seven point nine percent I think, and then in the I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then and then in the in the neo adjuvant group, how about in the neo adjuvant group? Uh, it was. Uh, sure. Or the negative negative CRM. So yeah, I think so it's 97 versus 90, 91.5. The the takeaway, you know, being a follow-on to the question that I asked Todd, right? Is it's not as if the neoadjuvant group is is getting necessarily a quote unquote worse therapy, but they are a high risk group. And if you're looking to prove that you're not likely harming patients by avoiding a neoadjuvant therapy in a well selected group, a lower positive CRM rate. Or a higher negative CRM rate is a better phrase for that. Suggests that you're doing right by these patients, right? It suggests that you're doing okay. You're not leaving behind a lot of tumor. Uh, I am grabbing this from the in the text, as opposed to if you're looking at any of the tables. But yeah, the the tables are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, in the text, it's less than point zero zero one, but. Um, so that's where I grab most of them. Their, their tables are a bit complicated because they compare multiple groups simultaneously. The other, uh, the useful p-values probably from tables are some of their multivariable assessment of likelihood of recurrence for the two groups. But so, so CRM appears to be appropriately low in the patients that are going directly to TME, right? So it seems like we're, we have a, a study protocol that at least, you know, it appears to be working. It appears to not at least be be harming patients or exposing them to, to increased risk. Um, and then how about the, the three-year local recurrence uh, differences, uh, Todd? So the three-year recurrence rate was 0 0.5. Yeah. Maybe, maybe raw numerically. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking percentage, though. <clears throat> so Beth already mentioned the overall rate was 3.1%. I believe, and then there's a slight difference between the uh, the TME group and the, yeah, the yeah, chemo yeah. group. Yes. Yeah. And then so the other the other aspect though is we're talking a lot about local control. We're talking about changes in whether or not you give someone a neoadjuvant therapy versus not. Again, driven that the goal of that neoadjuvant therapy is really improve local control <laughs> rates. But it's also important to consider that a, a pretty large proportion of rectal cancer patients, when they recur, recur distantly. And so, you know, this I think also mirrors that literature in that 20 of the 25 patients that had a local recurrence ultimately also had a distant metastasis, whether that was before simultaneously or later. And so a key takeaway, right? So local control is great, but local control and pulmonary metastasis is a very different situation. So just things to have in mind. Um, oh yeah, sorry. I think, yeah, sorry, Caleb, the trauma sign out is going on, sorry. But thank you for staying and listening. You can be late for trauma conference, that's fine. That's <laughs> but thanks. Um, and then, so there was also patients that were a bit more likely, um, or patients without local recurrence were more likely to have been downstaged. You know, as you can imagine, that's not necessarily something that we can select and change because these patients have to get the therapy before they can be reassessed for their downstaging. But this is probably kind of some insight into some patients that had more favorable tumor biology that responded to the therapy. And, you know, great, we can high five ourselves about that, but that's not something necessarily that we did. That's, that's probably their tumor biology that we're seeing. And then I think what to me was some of the more interesting results were the protocol deviations um, and, and how, they, how they discussed this. I think it was one of the second to last or maybe even last paragraphs of the results section 
Um, but they, they talk about that 215 patients that were, were treated off protocol and they say some were over treated, some were under treated. The, the reasons for doing so are highly variable and I don't think the point of this, but um, basically a patient was considered under treated if they would have normally by this protocol gone into the neoadjuvant chemo radiation group and they could have gotten nothing, they could have gotten just short course they could have gotten just chemotherapy. So it doesn't mean that they got no therapy. It just means that they got something other than conventional long course chemo radiation. And patients were considered over-treated kind of by the exact inverse. So if they would have gotten upfront TME and they got anything, not necessarily the long course that was being studied, but short course or something even more intense. And so they, they describe, you know, about a hundred in each group, those that were under-treated and over-treated. And then the, the differences in the, the local recurrence if you are undertreated or overtreated. Um, Beth, do you have that? So the three-year local recurrence for, I think it's yeah, maybe yeah. one of the last sentences mm -hmm. in that period. The three-year local recurrence rate was significantly lower in overtreated patients, mm -hmm. uh, 1%. Mm -hmm. And after undertreatment, that was 2.6%. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting, but I guess, is that a fair comparison? Right. I mean, these aren't really standardized groups. We don't know anything about their characteristics. Yeah. I think it's good kind of just like to observe, but I don't know if we can draw any conclusions from this. I think it's difficult too, because you would not have, from the outset of your observational study, you have predetermined that these are different biologic groups. Yeah. One has a more advanced tumor than the other, and then you're going to flip the treatment. So, so I think the comparison is maybe not I would, I would compare those that were undertreated versus those that got neoadjuvant therapy. And then I would compare those that were overtreated versus those that just got TME, right? Because those two groups should look like each other in terms of their preoperative characteristics. Mm -hmm. So that I think is something that, unfortunately, I don't think it was done in, in this paper, but I think it's something that might highlight, you know, kind of the pluses or minuses of overtreatment versus undertreatment a little bit better. But it's certainly interesting. And I think the other takeaway being that this in this figure, clearly under treatment is problematic in terms of your local recurrence. But really, none of the other groups did any worse than that, which was kind of given the conventional therapy of long course, right? The green line is, is the TME group. And then this is the over treatment group. So not a whole lot of, of probably statistical difference there. So at this point, I mean, really, we can open it up for discussion. But We've talked a little bit about the differences in observational versus randomized data already, so I won't re-go back over that. Um, in terms of the acceptability of low local recurrence in TME and, and the neoadjuvant groups, you know, could there have been even better downstaging if instead of neoadjuvant long course, they use short course with consolidation, if they use total neoadjuvant? I mean, I think those are interesting questions to pose, but it may be hard to justify a more aggressive treatment group in a trial that's really geared at trying to reduce over-treatment, but could be interesting. Um, and then the, the point that I was making on the previous slide is I think it would have been interesting had they made these comparisons, because the differences are in each case by basically a factor of two. So if you under-treat a patient that should probably get some local therapy based on their numbers, you effectively double their local recurrence rate. If you overtreat a patient that probably doesn't need it, you, you may quote unquote by relative risk have their local recurrence rate, but what is the real difference between one and 2%? You're really reducing it by 1%. And then they cite, you know, um, you know the number needed to treat, you know, in their numbers is, is around 200 or so, but based on that alone, it would be for every additional 100 patients, you would, you would prevent one local recurrence which is potentially hard to justify based on the side effects of therapy. Um, and then, but how would you explain this to patients? Because they could, patients could be given information that, you know, under treatment doubles their risk of recurrence, over treatment cuts it in half. Both of those are accurate by relative risk, but clearly a jump from four to almost 9% is very different than a drop from two to 1%. So it's important to know the numbers so that you can have a better informed discussion with the patient in terms of just relative risks, but talk about really kind of absolute risk reduction in, sort of in terms of, uh, instead of relative risk reduction. So, yeah. 
Yes, yeah, yes. But it will be, yeah, exactly. It will be the majority of what patients are given in terms of literature from drug and device companies because those can be the most kind of impressive statistics, but they are relative risks. They're not really informative to what we do every day. I want to say, yeah, I want to say it was around like 7% or so. So in this trial right here, under treatment, right. Yeah, but it was it was before, you know, a hundred percent of patients were getting a high quality pelvic MRI, and you know there is some inclusion of you know patients who are T three because it feels fixed on exam and things like that. And so, but but to Dr. Curl's point, if everything else that we do has gotten good enough that even quote unquote under treating is getting patients to the standard of care, that also lends credence to the argument that maybe you don't need highly aggressive neoadjuvant therapy in all patients, right? If, if even the quote unquote under treatment group is reaching a, a previously accepted standard of care, because like in the Quicksilver trial, what was their acceptable local recurrence rate? It was less than 10%, less than 10%, right? So this under treated group would be well below that. And yet, you know, on the last slide, I was just saying, hey, this is, you know, this is the one unacceptable group and these other three are acceptable. Not that I wish people to have local occurrences, but you kind of have to set a somewhat arbitrary threshold somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I left out. I think there's a protege trial that does do total neoadjuvant or something. Like that. It's all getting, these are actually using the exact same um, methods. Um, you are trying to treat, when you're trying to treat patients blindly, what is your best method? Before we had MRI, we had ultrasound. And then we had C, um, and that's where it's like that is. Before we had ultrasound, we had, you know, the pumps. Is it, yeah, improved sensitivity. Sorry, this doesn't project well, but you can kind of see that. The Yeah. Yeah. Local therapy. 
And that's when radiation surgery comes in. One of the things that goes to my nose. Yeah. Once they have a systemic disease, local therapists start taking it. So I did the wrong thing. So I don't know. Did it really want this to be like over time? As long as you're doing a high quality surgery. Right. And so it's really figuring out now, like, what kind of communication between the bulletin and the nose? And that's why this piece is going around. Are you referring to the inherent delays of actually delivery of chemotherapy? Yes. So, yeah. so let's say he keeps all the other taking the OR right now, see me first, mm -hmm. and then he comes back with positive tests. Most operative. So what percentage of people get post operative radiation? What is that? Who cares? Why does that matter? You get post operative radiation. Their functions are higher. Yeah. And you and, and then you're also potentially radiating a small bowel that's now down in the pelvis, you know, mm -hmm. so you get radiation in the pelvis. So this thing actually, because that was my I, I wrote a little note in the slide. This is like first starting me and people to get at post out, at least in this case, mm -hmm. that's in pretty low. And you're but in my mind, when people were talking about this the other day, it was like, what is that number? Nobody's describing what that number is. And these are places that have the premier radiologists and the premier surgeons and the premier whatever. And then when you put that out to the rest of the world, then you don't have things that are going to be unsuccessful, really sensitive, looking at MRI.
cost of a few of one. And so you have the best case of the This is what we talk about in the purple. And you know, the thing also knows is you're also usually MRI people after if someone's on a biopsy of the tumor and that muck around with it. So then, you know, there's this question of narrowing the narrow. They have certain criteria about the MRI that call it suspicious. You can't see on ultrasound for some. But I think that any of extra mural vascular plaques, that's that's more aggressive. Yeah, it's, there's an MRI for the CT scan and the angiogram. Yeah, what you see is all kinds of things. Yeah. What a good way to test an extra vascular. So someone has a major tumor in the tumor. It's a major wearing tumor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if, if, if unable to give neoadjuvant therapy, the other best test of biology is time. Okay. At the end of the day, like, time is your ally. You can time is your ally. You know, not so much. Just you know what it is. Um, you have more side effects than you try to think. You don't do it. To not versus not getting radiated. Yeah. Radiation is double the chance of Both of the chances are 30% between 60 or more. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's amazing when you're trying to have these discussions, if you don't know the numbers and all you can say is more or less, higher, lower, how quickly that becomes an uninformative conversation for the patient. Because they'll say, well, how much higher is that risk? How much more? How much less? And then you, you can't follow on. Um, but thank you. That was a very helpful discussion. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, we can open it up. But this is exactly to Dr. Carl's point. So this is the 2019 NCCN. Um, any T3, any N, and nowhere on here. Uh, is really a men and, and with clear CRM, right? With clear CRM, and nowhere on here is a mention of surgery. So, you know, it's not that not that everybody should get that, but I think you know the data is is showing that that may be reasonable in a highly selective so selected subgroup, and it's not quite yet in NCCN. I mean, obviously guidelines take time to incorporate data, but the questions that I would just post to the group are: Is it time for the guidelines to really kind of declare a specifically low risk low risk group? that may, you know, add to this algorithm, you know, surgery with, you know, an asterisk and caveats and things that are down at the bottom of the algorithm. But, you know, is that a reasonable possibility? I think perhaps based on the data that we've discussed. And then is probably, we didn't really get into it with the trials we presented, but is it time for the, to revise the TNM staging to incorporate CRM for rectal cancer? I mean, we incorporate age for thyroid cancer. We incorporate vascular invasion for early stage HCC. We incorporate all sorts of tumor markers, grade, oncotype recurrent score for breast. Is it time that we involve CRM or other risk factors for local recurrence for rectal cancer to just add nuance? Because TNM is really kind of a Halsteadian way of thinking about cancer that if you march beyond it with your surgery, you can cure. And that's true some of the time, but not all the time. Um, so that's my last slide. Happy to have more discussion, but thank you guys for kind of sticking with us for a while, but I, hopefully it was helpful.